Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Def Nayas, and I'm the director of Vitterevit. I'm thrilled that all of you are here to listen to Siva Thiessen. I came here via China um, to Rotterdam, even though I'm from Istanbul. And in China, I started thinking a lot about religion, um, what's going on in the, in the whole country, even though we have this perception that it's a completely communist country, just to see all the different competition between different religious tracts between Chinese Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, and of course evangelical Christian presence in the country, I started noticing a lot of parallels also. Um, t you know, that I should, be, I should have been thinking a long time ago about the history of the world. So uh, when I arrived to, and when I was on my way to Rotterdam, of course, I've been thinking also a lot about the European condition. Um, and Siva uh, Thiessen is actually one of the first people I met, thanks to Mariette's introduction at tent opening. And, um, and since then, we've been having quick coffees uh, around the corner and discussing, actually, some of the topics that could have been interesting for today. So I want to welcome you here and thank you also for agreeing to do this talk. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you Daphne for inviting me. And uh, it's true, we were talking for 10 minutes and she profiled me as a Catholic. And we were talking for 20 minutes and she asked me to uh, do a lecture here on religion. So I'm not an expert, but here we go. I have to put on this. By the way, this is the first lecture I've ever given sitting down, so I hope I won't <laughs> smash all this equipment here. As a kid, growing up in the old inner city of Tilburg, I was fascinated by my mom's semi-annual ritual of preparing a box containing soap, rice, flour, sugar, canned beans, and other basic foodstuffs. Twice a year, the church bells would broadcast a specific message throughout our urban community, announcing door-to-door -door visits by Capuchin minor monks who ran the Catholic church in our neighborhood. Usually unshaven, dressed in brown robes, their heads covered in capuchins and wearing worn-out sandals, they would step gently on our door. Then they would shake hands with my mom, introduce themselves politely, and engage in friendly conversation. Consequently, my mom offered them the box which these God-loving beggars gratefully accepted, accepted in the name of Francis of Assisi. During the 19th century, the southern province of North Brabant developed a two-phase ecclesiastical and cultural Catholicism, a development brilliantly documented by anthropologist Mart Bax. Centuries of repression and humiliation of Catholics by the Protestant North had also resulted in a shortage of seminaries, priests, and churches. As a consequence, a variety of orders of monks started establishing churches and parishes, like alien colonists penetrating occupied territory. In 1853, the Catholics were finally granted full civil rights and the Episcopal hierarchy was restored. By then, the Brabant landscape was already divided in secular and regular parishes. Secular priests were educated at seminaries, obedient to Episcopal bishops, the Dutch Archbishop at Utrecht and the Pope of Rome. Regulars were more autonomous, usually indifferent to any bishop or pope, obedient only to their respective monastery order rules. Think of the rules as expressed by Augustinians, Benedictines, Carmelites, Dominicans, Franciscans, and Jesuits. My family grew up in Capuchin minor parishes, led by beggar monks, practicing a simple life of praying and devotion, praising human and animal life, and drenched in an eco-spiritual lifestyle, totally devoid of materialism and consumerism. This non-ecclesiastical culture must have infected us, for without remorse and totally at ease, we would make fun of nuns, monks, popes and bishops, tell dirty jokes about them, castigate their hypocrisy and ridicule cel celibacy. Why should I take a priest in my confidence, my mother always said. He doesn't know shit about love, sex and marriage. I never heard one priest complain about, about our blasphemous behavior, nor did our parents or teachers. In 1930, after a heated debate with my grandfather, a northern Protestant of Herrnhuter denomination, a Capuchin succeeded in converting him to Catholicism. Returning home, the family legend goes, my granddad uttered the famous words, my God, they're right. I'm sure he was joking. However, his pragmatic conversion made him adapt much better to mainstream life and culture in Brabant, requiring a porous flexibility in order to move more smoothly through the public domain. 
I am not a religious person, and I never thought of my grandparents and parents as religious folks. However, I do feel a deep connection with the extra national culture of Catholicism, like they did. I feel as much at home in Belgium, France, Spain, Portugal, and Italy, as I find myself an alienated stranger in exotic countries like Germany or Scandinavia. I teach my kids love and understanding, how to burn candles in cathedrals and chapels, enjoy watching the processions of Mary, and consider, like my surrealist hero Louis Benoel did, the Eastern Drumming Festival at Calanda in Spain, the most moving event ever experienced on this planet. My parents bestowed my brother, sister, and me with a disinterest in materialism, insincerity, and injustice. Indeed, very far away echoes of my mom's food box and the Franciscan anarchism of the Tilburg Capuchins. However, my personal Catholic box contains more precious jewels, like the existential notion of bearing one's own cross in life, whatever that cross may be, or the conviction that the absence of written principles and a written philosophy of life, like the Protestant's Bible or the Muslim's Quran, is a blessing. Until 1970, with the Bible ranking high in the Catholic index of prohibited literature, Catholics were not supposed to read the Holy Book at all. The absence of a solid, materialized system of instruction enables you, thank God, to negotiate your way through life. It enables you to be existentially flexible, to always reconsider, regret, or redefine former opinions, options, or lifestyles. Again, I do not consider myself a religious person in a spiritual or believing sense. Overall, my relationship with religion is more or less rational and scientific, or better perhaps, biological. For organized religions, eminent biologist Edward Wilson wrote in his magnificent The Social Conquest of Earth, are ancient expressions of tribalism. Mutually shared and exchanged myths of creation appear to be a necessity for group selection in the evolution of our species. During the course of evolution, cooperative groups who employ the practice of altruism have outperformed individualistic groups. For instance, the strong individualistic Neanderthal man was outperformed by the far more cooperative Homo sapiens. Religion, Wilson wrote, offers the best a tribe has to offer, a committed community that gives heartful emotional support and welcomes and forgives. From today's perspective, however, living in a far more complex world than our faraway ancestors did, it is wise openly to question the tribal myths and gods of organized religion because they are stultifying and divisive, because they encourage ignorance and intolerance. Tribalism won't take us very far in our highly differentiated public domain. So yes, I try to understand and respect religion as a social force in encouraging altruism and cooperation. And yes, I gently and respectfully repudiate the claims of those in power who say they speak for God or say they are a special representative of God. This is what my Catholic grandparents and parents believed, and this is what I believe. I have always been fascinated by religion. My history master thesis at Erasmus University struck, although implicitly, an autobiographical court. My research boiled down to the migration of Catholic workers from Brabant to Rotterdam in the last quarter of the 19th century. Due to their hard labor, they contributed substantially to the breathtaking expansion of the port and to a newly built town on the south side of River Maas, better known as Rotterdam Zuid. My hero became the Catholic priest and activist Ludo Gompertz whose diaries I coincidentally found at the local city archive. Later, I studied history of theology and history of philosophy, emphasizing 19th and 20th century cultural and theoretical developments in the Netherlands. In my PhD thesis, The Spinozas, I chronicled the emergence of a non-academical philosophical movement of Dutch religious and non-religious writers, all inspired by the life and writings of Baruch de Spinoza. Another part of my academic work had to do with the arts, but that's another story. I have never written an academic account of religious life in Rotterdam. However, as a historian doing research, I was struck by the importance of local religious and ecclesiastical figures for the emancipation of migrants in urban Rotterdam. For Rotterdam, an arrival city par excellence, to borrow a notion from Doc Sanders' insightful book, religion proved very important as a force of emancipation, or in evolutionary terms, as a powerful tool for altruism and in-group cooperation, until today. Two decades ago, one of the most prominent social activists in Rotterdam was a reverend, Hans Visser of Pauluskerk in the city center. In 1979, Visser was appointed as reverend and transformed his church into a public shelter for the homeless, for drug addicts and prostitutes. 
His policies and provocations dominated the local and national news for years. He championed for the legislation of drugs and a free prostitution area, for which he even acclaimed global fame and global disgust, depending on your worldview. In 2000, he wrote his PhD thesis, an intellectual and practical account of the ideas of social philosopher Manuel Castells. One year later, when Rotterdam became cultural capital of Europe, he hosted an international symposium organized by Erasmus University and the Center of the Arts. Our international guests, among them Sadie Plant, Olu Ogviba, and Paul Miller, seem more interested in his singular reverend and his radical church than in the actual symposium on public art. And take a look at the last decade. Rotterdam has become the city of Pimfortuin, the city of Leef by Rotterdam, the city in which a substantial part of secular society took up arms against Islam, the religion of many today's new migrants. As a result, Rotterdam has also become the city of Islam, a religious dystopia, frequently mentioned by free thinkers such as Geert Wilders as an example of the cultural decay of Europe. Despite a well-intended series of public debates concerning the values and dangers of Islam in Rotterdam and organized by the city council, the conflict between acceptance and repudiation of Islam has not been solved yet. In January 2007, Islamic theologian Tariq Ramadan was appointed by the city council as cultural mediator, trying to activate and moderate the debate between Muslims and non-Muslims in the city. A common ground, unfortunately, could not be found. Eventually, Ramadan was fired for being biased in favor of advocating a political Islam. He left the city with frustration, leaving behind an equally frustrated city, filled with disappointed citizens, still unable to make up their minds properly, returning to business as usual and trying to figure out their own modus and attitude in the public domain again. God is not dead, German singer and musician Blixa Bargeld once argued. As long as we keep talking about him, he's alive. Blixa was right. In Rotterdam, God never left. It is my humble conviction that the Rotterdam battle against religion is not a contemporary phenomenon or an unexpected or coincidental eruption in secular society. I think this battle is crucial for understanding the specific nature of this specific arrival city at River Maas. Today I would like to share some historical episodes with you. History never repeats itself. However, I do think contemporary conflicts over religion are mirrored in earlier stages of Rotterdam's history. It's hot in here. Between 1875 and 1920, Rotterdam matured from a provincial town to an urban industrial city. During this period, migration floods doubled the city's population three times in a row. It's amazing. Creating dramatic growing pains and social and religious tensions. Many new industrial cities in Europe became more secular. In Rotterdam, however, religious churches and cults started to flourish. In their famous book, The Rise of the Great Work City, The Groei van de Grote Werkstad, 1952, Bauman and Bauman outlined the emergence of a fascinating cobweb of cults and sects in Rotterdam. Nowhere in Western Europe, they argue, so many different cults and religions were established. That landscape is still visible today. Living in the village community of Kralingen, I count dozens of mosques, churches and religious institutes only a stone's throw away from my house, including Muslims, Catholics and Christian denominations like Pentecostalism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, but also a variety of Christian Suriname, Chinese and African churches, halls of Rosicrucians, Freemasons and Theosophists, and even three Jewish cemeteries. Many 19th century migrants had religious backgrounds. Most of them did not arrive spontaneously. They were recruited by mobile commercial employment agencies, financed by big corporations like port and railway companies. Desperately in need for workers who would never protest against bad working or housing conditions, who would accept any wage, and who would work up to 15 hours a day without complaining, these employment agencies made use of anthropological and sociographical literature about backward areas like the Veluwe or the Langstraat. Its populations, used to poverty, humbleness, and semi-feudal traditions, were valued as a perfect army of boerenarbeiders for the new city at River Maas. During post-war time, this type of workers' recruitment, characterized by a systematic focus on specific rural regions, was also exploited in Turkey and Morocco. 
Whole families and extended families were recruited and transported to the capitalist dystopia of Rotterdam. Local newspapers, during the period of the first migration, spoke of Rotterdam as Plutopolis, or cash capital. This commercial and systematic recruitment of workers from traditional, rural, religious, and sometimes feudal areas contributed equally to a constant influx of religious ideas and practices. As Bauman and Bauman wrote about the first generation of migrants, extreme mobile populations going through various stages of transition are indeed inclined to say farewell to their traditional religious organizations. However, under drastically changed social circumstances, they become hypersensitive to emotional group formation. Conditions at Feyenoord were very poor, and that's a euphemism. Workers from Brabant, often employed as port diggers and polder workers, were initially housed in damp, leaking tents filled with fleas and dirty bacteria. The tents were led by a totalitarian boss whose wife or sister washed their clothes and would cook meals, usually cheap, watery and disgusting potato soup. For these compulsory services, they withheld money from the workers' wages. Later, the workers were housed in wooden sheds. That was the first form of social housing at Feyenoord. The conditions for the railway workers were just as poor. They had to make very long days and sometimes they would fall asleep. If a wagon or train crashed due to a personal mistake, the unlucky worker was arrested and often sentenced in court. Ironically, the main railway company was called the SS, Staatsspoorwegen. Since wages were very low, crime flourished. Robbery, theft and fraud put severe pressures on the local community, but also contributed to a thriving black economy. If Catholic workers wanted to attend Sunday Mass in church, they had to rent small boats in order to row to the other side of the river, to the Catholic parish of Kralingen. But Kralingen soon got disgusted with his new barbarian visitors. Local hit squads conflicted fights over again and forced the Southerners to stay on their own side of the river. Maybe the birth of the so-called Rotterdam South mentality might be situated here. Early descriptions of the new migrant town at Feyenoord, as recorded by Catholic historian Ludovicus Rogier, resemble descriptions of the anarchic and violent villages of Wild West America. In the mid-70s, the first Catholic priest arrived, Ludo Gompertz. He was trained in the bar and prostitute district of poverty-stricken downtown Amsterdam and headed for a new challenge in the ever-expanding world of Dutch capitalism and industrialism. Arriving at the wilderness of Feyenoord, he was shocked. He first built a small wooden church at Rundgestraat, bought a fierce-looking German shepherd dog and armed himself with a gun. Consequently, he started visiting workers and their family, trying to gain their trust. He would talk, take notes, and started to compile an impressive archive about working and housing conditions, education of children, wages, and spare time activities. In the early 80s, he took his notes to The Hague and started lobbying among politicians. Finally, he succeeded in convincing the parliament that social legislation was necessary. As a result, the first big national labor inquiry was organized, resulting in better conditions for the working classes in Rotterdam. Gompert, a priest, became the first working class hero at Feyenoord. He was the first one who took up arms against the brutal capitalism of Lodewijk Pinkovs, the famous Jewish investor, project developer, and shipping entrepreneur, who later fled to New York, his bags packed with money, and leaving behind the bank report of Rotterdam. His disappearance fueled anti-Semitism among Rotterdam elites, Rotterdam banker and port investor, for instance, Maarten Mees, criticized the Jews for the lack of morality. But in the archives, I recently discovered that our two-dimensional reception of Pinkoff deserves reconsideration. He also passionately advocated free thought in the Netherlands, co-financed Dutch Spinoza research, very important, and became a mecenas of the bronze statue of Spinoza at The Hague. In this sense, he also played a role in liberating Dutch culture from the suffocating straightjacking of reverence, church, and theology. Ten years ago, Pinkoff himself was honored with a bronze sculpture to be placed at Feyenoord. Apparently, the city has forgiven him. Unfortunately, the city forgot about his Catholic opponent. When Gompertz died, hundreds of workers from Feyenoord accompanied him to his grave at the Catholic burial ground of Krozeck. His coffin was placed on a beautifully decorated black coach pulled by ten horses. They marched silently through the city of Rotterdam, offering the first and impressive manifestation of the enduring presence of Southern Catholic migrants in Rotterdam. Today, even his grave has vanished into oblivion. 
At the other side of the river, an equally important religious figure rose to prominence. A young radical theologian, Willem Ming, was appointed in 1875 as a reverend of the Lutheran Church at the Mandelaan in the city center. Searching for data in the Civil Affairs Administration archive, I found out he had listed himself as a new citizen of Rotterdam in a very remarkable way. In the records, a civil servant had written, name, Willem Ming, profession, preacherman, religion, none. His Sunday morning sermons were very popular and attracted large crowds. Meng was a gifted and charismatic speaker, a magnificent performer and a restless reader, indulging himself in philosophical and scientific literature. He aimed at liberating his audience from the fear of God. Meng tried to convince his listeners that they had to create a better life on this earth, not in some virtual afterlife. His message was very simple. Free your mind, love life, make friends, read books and study contemporary ideas. He would stand on his pulpit, his arms spread out, his eyes pointed at the ceiling, shouting, There is no God. If God exists, let him strike me with lightning now. An arbitrary churchgoer had to keep a close eye on the watch, as men would wait 60 seconds for God to punish him for his blasphemous behavior. In total silence and paralyzed by fear, the audience waited for God's wrath, which never arrived. Meanwhile, irritation grew within the church administration board. And finally, the godless and blasphemous Meng was fired. He found a new place to deliver his speeches at a culture hall called Unity and Consensus, Eenheid en Overeenstemming, at Scheepmakershaven, not far from here. His reputation had grown immensely over the years, and every Sunday, thousands of men and women, hungry for knowledge and excited by his presence, crowded at the hall. Since there was not enough space inside, Many hundreds flocked outside, engaging in, heat, engaging in heated debates about religion, free thought, and social issues. At Unity and Consensus, Meng lectured about literature, about theater, painting, philosophy, ethics, and socialism. He gradually turned into a full-blown ethical anarchist, becoming a kind of secular messiah, similar to the status anarchist Ferdinand Domla Neuhaus was achieving in Amsterdam. Rotterdam got nervous, very nervous. The Sunday crowds in the streets started to attract more and more angry religious protesters who shouted sh slogans like, cut up the Antichrist, or butcher his godless body, lynch the bastard. One day hit squads attacked his coach and pushed it over, injuring a frightened man who had to be taken to hospital. His wife and children were intimidated, his house attacked and his windows thrown. Finally, in a desperate attempt to save his own life and his family's, Meng fled the city, never to return. After his leave to Broek in Waterland, near Amsterdam, he started an anarchist magazine, Light and Truth, Licht and Waarheid, which evolved within three years into the first theosophical magazine in the Netherlands. One of his admirers was Bernard Damme, a bright young man working as a civil servant in the port of Rotterdam. He lost his faith in religion, and inspired by Meng, he started studying philosophy and natural sciences. But how to get access to books? The famous physician Jan Rutgers was the first, uh, you know this guy, the Rutgers Stichting. Jan Rutgers was the first educated high society member to open his house and personal library at Haringvliet for workers, longing for possibilities to satisfy their intellectual appetite. In 1909, this library function was taken over by the newly found Our House, Ons Huis, at Gouvernestraat, today better known as Lantaarn Venster. Our House, financed by shipping entrepreneur Ari van Beekum, appointed Anne de Koe as its first director. De Koe was a Christian anarchist and an admirer of the pacifist lifestyle of Tolstoy. Through self-study, Bernard Damme reached the conclusion. He too had to become an anarchist and a philosopher, or better, an anarchist philosopher, no, a stand-up philosopher, bringing philosophic ideas from the libraries to the working classes by giving lectures in cantinas, union halls, and political venues. He also started publishing a series of books on Spinoza, Erasmus, the Greek philosophers, Hendrik Ibsen, Multatuli, Domino Neuhaus, and on subjects like monism, philosophical materialism, and scepticism. His books, written very clearly and sold very cheaply in respectable editions in order to reach the working masses, aimed at freeing yourself from religious constraints, at the pride of becoming an autodidact, at a do-it-yourself culture. Yes, all ingredients so typical for Rotterdam's mentality to become. In his house at Lambertestraat in Kralingen, 
Dahmer also edited the Rotterdam edition of Anarchist, a very popular weekly for the homeless, the godless, and the stateless, as its subtitle read. According to historian Janneke Welker, Amsterdam anarchists were considered the homeless, later werden de krakers. Anarchists from The Hague were labeled as the stateless, eh, politiek in de buurt. And the Rotterdam working class activists were classified as the godless. So around 1900, it was not so much the economic class struggle between bosses and workers that marked the top of the social agenda. However, it was the battle for and against religion that characterized the arrival city of Rotterdam. This battle became even more dominant and visible during the interbellum. In the 20s and 30s, reading groups, debate centers, and private philosophical schools flourished, creating a debate landscape probably unmatched in the Netherlands. Many squares, like Noordmolenplein, had soap boxes on which preachers, priests, atheists, religious socialists, or free thinkers defended their points of view. In Rotterdam, God was fashionable, even hotter than hot. The Rotterdam city market had a huge tent, ran by a radical bookseller who organized debates between Christian and free thinkers. Another famous school was the philosophical local school of Jan Burger, a former preacher who attracted a substantial following. His Hegelian ideas and books are still published today by an old anarchist, free thinker, and an admirer of Pim Fortuyn in Rotterdam. There are more of these old free spirit entrepreneurs, like small Rotterdam publishing company Cagliostro, who consider the older anti-religious movement as a predecessor of the Pim Fortuyn and Leva revolt against it revolt against Islam. These interesting ideological connections between the older and the new anti-religious movement have not been studied yet. In his memoirs, Freethinker, and later chief editor of foreign news of Algemeen Handelsblad, Ante Constance, described the vitality of this Rotterdam debating culture. Every Sunday, he recalled, all cafes, cinemas, and theaters in the city center were rented by organizations and packed with locals. Like in the days of Willem Meng, the many unfortunates who were unable to get tickets flocked outside, engaging in their own disputes and debates. Catholic, Protestant, and socialist organizations would send their favorite debaters to Rotterdam. The two most famous debating organizations in those days were the Dawn, the Dageraad, and High Noon, the Middaghoogte. Beautiful to see the Enlightenment, the Dageraad, the Middaghoogte, Dawn, High Noon. The Dawn, a society in favor of free thought, was founded by Freemasons in 1855 and reached reach its peak in the 20s and 30s. They initially attacked Christianity and later all religions and considered religion a backward force, debilitating the minds of the people and frustrating social and cultural progress. Members of the Dawn went from door to door, asking people to sign a statement in which they agreed to give up the membership of a church. High Noon was founded in the 20s in an attempt to stop the successful march of the freethinkers and to defend God as a supernatural hero. Founder Arnold Hendrik de Hartog was an influential and eminent theologian with a strong social consciousness and also a great debater. In 1922, Ante Constance and Arnold de Hartog got engaged in a legendary de debate in the Oude Doelen at Kool Singel. The venue was overcrowded, the audiences inside and outside excited. Yes, this was a mental boxing match, as in those days, debating was an exhausting event. First, the speakers would each talk for 45 minutes. Then they would each talk for another 15 minutes. And finally, another five minutes each to sum up their conclusions. This is what I call a debate. After 130 minutes, more than two hours, the audience was finally allowed to participate. At the end of the day, people could, could make up their own minds. Shall we kick God out of our lives, or is he allowed to stay in? The war and the bombing of Rotterdam did not kill this social-religious climate. On the contrary, in 1946, a group of socialists and their affiliates, among them Alexander Bos, director of the Rotterdam Social Housing Department, and modern architect Willem van Tijen, designer of Zuidwijk, published The City of the Future, The Future of the City. This one, I brought it with me. The Stad der Toekomst, the Toekomst der Stad. <coughs> they proposed a new kind of city directed by a strong city government to be built as a modern series of core neighborhoods from the perspective of the Wijkgedachte. This is how most of us remember this book today, as a plea for garden cities and modern, clean and green working class neighborhoods south of River Maas. Think of Van Tijen Zuidwijk or Pendrecht, designed by Marxist and Baalhaus pupil Lotte Stambeze. However, in rereading the book, 
I was struck by the all evading religious and religious socialist spirit that haunt our views on the revitalization of Rotterdam. We do not find a typical modern socialist or materialist analysis of Rotterdam, and the working classes are not romanticized. At first reading, the book offers, offers a rather pessimistic discourse in which the mental and cultural degradation of the working masses is sketched from the perspective of famous pessimist philosopher José Ortega y Gasset. Industrialism, commerce, and urban hostility against nature, the writers argue, have turned once powerful craftsmen into unhappy working and consuming zombies, devoid of mental health, culture, sociability, and solidarity, thus making them an easy target for the Nazis, as happened during the war. The book's focus on mental uplifting, its pleas for religious revival, philosophical schools, an ecological sensibility, and culture halls in neighborhoods resemble the atmosphere of Dutch van der Sekkele culture, culture, when the spiritual emptiness of modernity was criticized severely. Almost 50 years earlier, the very popular Dutch philosopher Johannes Diederik Bierens de Haan developed a philosophy of life he called transcendental socialism. Uh, he thought socialism should not be a philosophy of the world, but socialism should be a philosophy of life. It is precisely this idealistic, non-materialistic brand of socialism, initially developed as a spiritual attack on Marxism and social anarchism, that dominates the pages of the city of our future. Bierens de Haan was also one of the founding fathers of the first Dutch philosophical journal, Tijdschrift voor Wijsbegeerte, the Journal for Philosophy, and the International School for Wijsbegeerte, International School of Philosophy. Both media, still existing, offer the non-academic critique of modern civilization, of industrialism, consumerism, and our retreat from nature. Its adherents, writers, teachers, subscribers, and pupils, calling themselves a movement, aimed at mental, religious, and philosophical uplifting within the modern condition. This movement reached its peak in pre-war days, culminating in a surrealist landscape of religious socialists, religious anarcho-communists, and a curious variety of religious political movements and parties, so typical for Dutch interbellum culture. In the early 60s, a modern street in Rotterdam's garden city, Lombardia, was named after Bierensdijn, but ironically, the neighborhood is called the Karl Marx neighborhood. Unfortunately, our history of the Wederopbouw, regeneration, is merely written from the perspective of architecture, city making, and city policies of the city council. We care more about stones than we care about ideas. We care more about structure than we call about, care about people. Consequently, we do not know much about religious and philosophical developments and movements in the 50s and early 60s against the background of Wederopbouw. It's a pity a subject like the soci religious socialist roots of of modern post-war Rotterdam have not been studied properly yet. The religious socialist approach of the Alexander Bosch group was an honest but failed attempt to finally overcome the Rotterdam religion conflicts of pre-war times. Yes, this group criticized traditional churches, but they also denounced the hardcore atheism of Marxists and freethinkers. They knew Rotterdam had to come up with another plan. They knew a modern city should reserve a prominent role for religion. They envisioned a new brand of modern citizen, a socialized and cultured citizen, experiencing and celebrating a religious or philosophical sense of belonging, a citizen able to express and practice, able to express and practice unity and solidarity. And exactly here, the arts creep in. The Rotterdam Wederopbouw became a fertile ground for a new generation of public artists. While the Alexander Bosch group was formed in the circle of Our House, Ons Huis, Lantaarn Vincent, Another group emerged, also in our house. Group R, as they labeled themselves, was the first post-war artist initiative in Rotterdam. They denounced pre-war traditionalism, including religious and ecclesiastical traditionalism. However, they also denounced the avant-garde and political radicalism. A new approach needed to be exploited. The central figure of this group was Louis van Rode. He pleaded for collectively produced artworks, for making art accessible to citizens via public art, and for a focus on printed multiples in order to take art from elitist galleries to people's daily living rooms. During the 50s and 60s, he produced a whole series of public artworks commissioned by architects of the Wederopbouw, like the Brothers Kraaienvanger. Think of his huge work on the new post office building at Centraal Station, his mosaic of Erasmus at Kolsingel, and his portrait of a family at West Black. Very close. Over the years, it has been very hard to classify Louis van Rode. Some have branded him as a socialist. Others have called him, 
have called him a pantheist. I consider him a religious socialist, driven by the same motivations that fueled the Alexander Bos group and our house. The Rotterdam battle between modernism and religious socialism, or to put it more precisely, the attempt to overcome the coldness of modernity by the emotional call of Wederopbaukunst is nicely portrayed in these two images. On the left side, you see a modern, rational, and mathematical drawing of family life in the future city, designed by Lotte Stambeze for Pendrecht. On the right side, you see Louis van Rode's answer at West Blaak, an organic, warm, spiritual, and hopeful vision of togetherness, sociability, and belonging in the same city. This artwork could also have been a decoration for a Catholic church. As you might note, Van Rode was a descendant of Catholic migrants in Rotterdam Zuid. Recently, I have to see if I can. Yeah. Very recently, 60 glass applique windows have been designed for the Pendrecht neighborhood. In their artworks, five different art artists have instigated a dialogue with founder Lot Stambeze. Unintentionally, the same theme pops up again. Here we see a contemporary remix of the earlier 1950s images. On top, Ben Zegers elaborates on the theme of structure and geometry, so crucial for post-war Rotterdam. On the bottom, Sarianne Breuker touches upon Louis van Rode's social and spiritual interpretation of city life. Also crucial for understanding the same city of Rotterdam. To me, these kind of considerations hint at the importance of the city of the future. This is not only a book about architecture, city making and wederopbouw. It also offers a passionate plea for a mental architecture. That is, how to respect different religions and beliefs in modern times and how to overcome the tragic tribal conflicts in the public domains of today's arrival city. A proper answer has not been found yet. So I would like to leave you with this. Be honest, did Alderman Oran Kaya have other hopes when he appointed Tarek Ramadan as a religious bridge builder in Rotterdam? I don't think so. And be honest again, was Pim Fortuyn really more fanatical than the fundamentalist free thinkers of the dawn in the 20s and 30s? I don't think so. And did the despite reverend Hans Fischer differ so much from predecessors like Ludo Gompertz or Willem Meng? I don't think so. They all tried to teach us something about our city. Rotterdam is a young and restless city, a becoming of age city, trapped in its own nervous and often emotionally disturbed adolescence pulled and pushed dialectically ahead by the force of migration and religion on one side and the force of fear and repression on the other side. Living and growing up in Rotterdam requires stamina and resilience. If you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. No wonder street kids have dubbed the city's name as Rafa. We may like it or not, Rotterdam appears to be a city living up to the words of Samuel Beckett. Ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Try again, fail again, feel better. Thanks. Are there any questions from the public? Anyone wants to? Thank you. Uh, thank you for such a, a really lively and a wonderfully grounding presentation. Uh, it was really refreshing to enjoy uh, th this kind of content in this kind of context. It was also wonderful to, to hear uh, Rotterdam be referred to as an adolescent city because I'm from Australia myself. And <laughs> a deeply adolescent, adolescent place. But my question is that I'd, I'd love it if you could maybe uh, enter into this um, moment that you said of the structure of a, a debate. Uh, just because, um, of course, I've been involved with colleagues and friends in some of the conversations about populism and, and the issues that happened around the cuts to culture and the difficulty in organizing around that and the difficulty in uh, growing strong debates around that within the community. Um, and one thing that my Dutch colleagues often said to me was that they felt that there was a lack of um, social structures that, are now, that, that enabled a tough debate that didn't become personal. And so I'm really interested to hear that within this religious context you say there was a structure for a, for a debating structure. I'm interested to know maybe more about it from your research and what you think happened to that tradition. Thank you. Well, I think uh, that tradition totally got extinct after the war. 
and it was very lively in Rotterdam. And I've been talking with a lot of historians, historians about it, and we, we don't really understand why nobody ever wrote a book about it. Because it's really interesting if you read about all these weekends, all these clubs and bars, and, and all these debates going on everywhere. So um, maybe it belongs to the pre-television, pre-radio days to be involved in all these kind of discussions. But uh, I think it's really is interesting that we have this kind of uh, we had this kind of tradition. And why not pick it up? I mean, there are a lot of debates like here. You know, there are a lot of debates going on today as well. And um, um, but I think there's also something else, and that's the other what I was trying to point at that it also led to a lot of people to believe that debating is not enough. We should also try to develop something else, which would, you know, that, uh, that it is possible to have a public domain in which also individuals can have these kind of debates. So a kind of, kind of understanding and res res respect for religion itself, of all these um, um, attitudes, um, but not, not as fierce as in pre-war days was existing, because I think the climate was much, much, much more hard in the 20s and 30s as it is now. And people say, oh, Geert Wilders, oh, Pim Fortuyn, oh, it's, uh, you know, and I think the climate was really, really hard. And even if you read in the magazines and the newspapers how, uh, you know, uh, uh, th that's why I had some, some quotes from newspapers from the Willem Meng, lynch the bastard, cut up his, you know, it's very physical and violent and, um, uh, so I think if uh, people like Willem Meng or Bernard Dammer would live in these days, they would say, well, you know, it's, a, it's a quiet, quiet city. It's not, it's not that bad. So um, I'm not saying that it's, that it's funny to live in Rotterdam today, but I think it's also, it's, it's a kind of, um, I don't know. It's, um, it's interesting. I haven't thought about it, what, what happened to it. And um, what I do think is that the, the socialist, the religious socialist kind of approach never got a chance because in the 60s, socialist, strong socialist governments took over in, in Rotterdam. Uh, and, and people didn't go to church and we started breaking away all these churches. And uh, you can see it here as well. This is the city of the future. This is a painting by Marius Richter, uh, quite a famous Rotterdam artist. And he, he, he made this painting. So, this is the image people had of the future. Imagine the city was still completely empty in those days. So it's a nice kind of village with a church in the middle. So it's a kind of uh, friendly town. But I'm not sure what happened to this debating culture. I think it disappeared. And uh, maybe a lot of frustration went underground. Because the city council appeared to have taken over the modern socialist secular views of the left wing before the war. And uh, I'm not sure. Thanks again for this wonderful talk. I'm just wondering if, um, to what extent do you think that this Rotterdam context or Rotterdam could actually extend to a European condition? The Rotterdam context with Geert Wilders, Pim Fertan, to what extent do you believe it's actually symptomatic of a whole European condition, whether it's you know, the French or the German or... Um, I don't know, actually. That's a difficult question now. It's a kind of... Uh, to get into politics. Um, um, I do think it's interesting to, to make comparisons with uh, other cities with, uh, which are typical arrival cities like Rotterdam. Because the city really grew so fast, you can't, it's, it's, un, it's unimaginable. And um, so people, each time people have to cope with this, with this rapid growth. And I think it's happening everywhere. Uh, in the same sense as that you have uh, cities that are uh, rapidly shrinking now. So uh, it might be interesting to, to uh, compare cities that are rapidly growing, rapidly shrinking. And um, I don't know. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure. But I think it's not a coincidence that uh, Pim Fertuyn became big in Rotterdam, in the same sense as uh, Geert Wilders is maybe liked in Rotterdam. Uh, because there's also a very long tradition, a very fertile grounds of these kind of ideas, of very opposing views of religion and tradition.
Any more questions? Sorry, this debating culture. Uh, you made it clear that it was predominantly, uh, let's say, a working class phenomena. Was it also, in, uh, as far as your sources indicate, gendered? Was it a predominantly male debating culture, or was it mixed in the sense of gender? It's very interesting. Uh, I think it was predominantly male. Mm -hmm. And the uh, interesting thing is that the, uh, exactly the movement, the religious socialist movements of the, uh, between the two wars, they were female dominated. It's interesting. I mean, my, my biggest hero is Clara Wiegman, Clara Meyer Wiegman, you probably know her, of the Wieg Clara Wiegman Stichting. And she's uh, one of the first to express, uh, she was a, law, uh, a lawyer. She studied law and she, was, she, she became one of the biggest campaigners of the abolition movement in punishment law. And uh, so there are a lot, were a lot of women there. You, and there's still a thing you see at uh, the subscribers to the Journal for Philosophy were a lot of women. And the same goes for the International School for Philosophy in Leusden and Amersfoort, first in Amersfoort, now in Leusden. There were a lot of ladies involved. And uh, also the uh, upper classes were involved, a lot of ladies. Like Getreide Kaptein Muiske. And there are a lot of other uh, women who have written beautiful books about that. So it's, it, it's interesting. I've never thought about that. But um, I think uh, indeed the religious socialist movement had far more women included than the uh, older free thinker movement. That's true? Yes, I, I mean, it's, it's kind of the same thinking. It's that uh, I did a lot of research on New York City. Um, and you do see the same phenomenon. You see intensive debate in clubs, uh, yeah. creation of public sphere in immigrant uh, neighborhoods in, in, from the 1880s until yeah. 1920s. So probably it has to do with the fact that it's an arrival city. And I'm not sure in that sense if it has disappeared, of only that we don't see it, because it's happening in immigrant communities. Yeah, right. That's so, why I said I think it's... Yeah. Perhaps it went underground, but it's still there. I don't know for sure. Uh, yeah. I don't know of any research done in Rotterdam, so. Well, uh, we, we live in Rotterdam West, and you see everywhere these cultural clubs of uh, Turkish and Moroccan yeah. um, uh, social clubs, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's male again. <laughs> it's yeah. very absolutely male dominant uh, public sphere. But I mean, so I mean, probably it's basically that we don't know much about it, rather sure. than that it has disappeared, or at least I mean that particular mode, you yeah, know, I yeah. mean, it's, uh, and that in a sense it has also to do with the fact that probably at the time more things were published and maybe it's going in in other media or, you know, the, the financial structures are diff more difficult to know. Yeah, today on, on, to on the internet. Yeah, yeah maybe in, on the like internet that. or yeah. not printed in, yeah. in, in the traditional way. Yeah. So it may be there to see comparisons. Yeah. And that would be interesting to see it from an international perspective. It's true. Do other cities where you see you know, in periods of intense migration, see a similar kind of debating culture, mm -hmm. uh, where religion always plays a role because mostly these people come from pretty traditional areas uh, yeah. in their home countries. Yeah. But maybe what you're arguing is actually conservative communities who moved to Rotterdam in 19th century. And you actually made the point that the deep secularization that took place in Rotterdam actually probably made some communities even more conservative. Um, do you feel, um, I mean obviously there's, there was an attempt by the city to resolve um, a cross-pollination or some sort of mutual understanding between different communities in the city, including Islamic communities and so forth. Um, do, you, do you think about the contemporary condition um, rather more normalized than 10 years ago? Or is this something now being ignored? Um, the question of religion, I mean, you, you make the title, God never left the city. On the other side, obviously, church is not active anymore, church withdrew, religion withdrew, deep secularization happened. What we're seeing more within the Islamic communities, all kinds of different 
trajectories. Some are purely faith-based, some are purely economically driven, some are more network-based. I don't think there is enough research going actually into what's happening in different Islamic communities in Rotterdam or in general, in neither in Egypt nor in... Um, do you, I mean, also with Tariq Ramadan's dismissal, also the European capital moment when all the religious leaders came together to debate, I think that we had that instance in, in Rotterdam. It sort of reminded me of what was happening in 12th century in Mongolia, <laughs> when, um, when all the you know, Franciscan monks and Nestorian man monks and Tibetan monks would come and sort of debate the question of God. And at the end, the Mongolian Han, the grandson of Genghis Han, he would say, as long as you submit to me, mm. As, you know, there are ways to get to God, it doesn't matter how you get to it, as long as you submit to the general rule. Um, but you think genetically it's still in the codes of the city, right? Like, I think so. Yeah. And I think the problem has not been solved yet, so it will erupt again and again. But do you think it's making religion stronger in terms of, especially, I mean, the defense line is obviously the Islamic communities in, in, in Rotterdam. Do you think the existence of the rise of the Muslim networks also as an economic force, do you think that is, um, as it's triggering the defenses, do you think it's making religion stronger? Again, in terms of uh, Christianity I'm talking about. I'm not talking about organized religions, I don't know for that, but I think, uh, like Bauman and Bauman said in a book about the first migration wave, uh, the, um, the, um, the very strong tendency to emotional group formation is still there. And uh, that's interesting. There's this architect, um, what's his name? Oh, shit, I forgot about his name. He's, he's, he's done all these renovations of these Pendrecht buildings of uh, Lotus Lam And, uh, and uh, why did he do that? He's campaigning in Rotterdam for maintaining the portique. What's portique in English? The portique. Yeah, arcade. So that you share the entrance and you share the hallway to go up to your houses. And he says one of the, the bigger movements in Rotterdam, in the restructuring of Rotterdam, is a campaign against the portique because we don't like portiques anymore. We don't want to have our neighbors on the same stairs. And uh, he says we need the portique because the portique is the strongest environment of public debate. This is the place where people, ordinary people, debate about their laundry, about their, their, their rubbish, about their dirt about you know, being polite and keeping up the door. And if we kill all these uh, uh, public-private spaces, middle grounds in the city, there's nothing left and people will become harder against each other. So that's what he likes about this old Marxist tradition of Lotus Tambesen. Yeah? Is that so? I think so. He wrote about it? It's his idea? Interesting. Well, I just know it from the guy who, who runs all these renovations, and he's a really strong campaigner for all these uh, um, Marxist neighborhoods because they have all these portiques. Yeah? Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, it's Prompts and triggers. Also, I would like to invite you to go upstairs to see the show of Mirch Algen Ringborg. Um, that is somehow relating to the talk we had today. And um, we're going to continue these discussions. We have an opening end of June, 28th of June here, by Chinese artist Chu Jujie. Um, another defense line possibly in, in the future of Europe. And the invites you can pick up at the reception desk. It's, they are printed beautifully on a Bible paper. <laughs> so to continue the conversation. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>